What's up guys? Zach here. You're watching Fish and Forage. I have a very special episode for you today. This is actually the first episode in a series that I'm going to call the quest for a fish of a thousand casts. Something like that. So the fish of a thousand casts I'm talking about is of course the winter steelhead. Now in the Pacific Northwest, this fish is considered almost like a holy grail. People prepare and plan and look forward to winter steelhead season all year for good reason. They, they are uh, beautiful fish. They are incredibly hard to find. You know, they, they don't get their name fish of a thousand casts for nothing. Uh, it takes a lot of work. So I wanted to start this series off by saying not every video I'm going to catch a fish, but I hope that every video I can at least learn something and teach you guys something. Today it's, it's kind of early. We're actually not even like mid-December, so the runs haven't really started yet. There are a couple here and there that I'm seeing online, but it's really sparse. There's also even still some late summers, so it's not really peak time. So I wanted to start this series now in this dead time so we can kind of you know, get into the groove. I wanna do a lot of how-tos. Uh, in fact, today I'm gonna to do a how-to on drift fishing with more in-depth information. If you guys are new here and you're just joining, definitely hit that subscribe button to follow me on my journey to catch this fish this year. This series is gonna be essentially just my entire season's worth of winter steelhead fishing. So that should be fun. All right, guys. We are at our first spot of the Fish of a Thousand Cast series. I'm gonna start out with my secret delicious steelhead candy. Drifting through this little tail out here. We might get lucky. So all I'm using is a simple sliding bobber. Half ounce, the quarter ounce uh, bobber weight, 15 pound fluorocarbon leader to a one knot or one hook, one size hook, and a tiny ball of eggs, cured with orange. It's a very surprising how well this, this bait sack holds up. I've put it through seven or eight drifts now, and it's not, no sign of, of uh, breaking down at all. So I guess today, because it's so early, I'm not really expecting to catch me a steelhead, and at the very least clean up some mess. We're gonna go ahead and fish this drift here. It actually looks really nice. We're gonna start with our drifting setup. So I have a 10 foot six Akuma Guide Select Pro. I recommend Akuma. So the Guide Select Pro is kind of a higher level model, but you can get the, the SST models for pretty reasonably priced. Uh, anything in like the nine to 11 foot range is perfect for drift fishing. You want that extra reach and the extra length to be able to mend properly and make sure your bobber drifts nice and consistently. Today I have it paired up with my Akuma Avenger. Any size three to 4,000, really just like 2,500 to 4,000 is, is perfect for, for a steelhead or salmon for that matter. And uh, it'll pair up nicely with, with this rod. Now on that reel, I have 30 pound high vis braid. I like high vis because you can see where it goes in the water. You can see where it's, where it's laying and where it's bowing and it lets you mend a lot easier. So I recommend high vis not everyone does. You do have a leader here of fluorocarbon, so it's not like the fish can see, you know, directly to that, that braid. But on that braid, we have our bobber. I prefer a one half ounce, unless I know I'm fishing with a lot of small baits, in which case I'll go one quarter ounce. This is a sliding bobber. And so you have this bobber stop on the line and you can actually adjust your depth. So if it's too deep and you keep hitting the bottom, you can bring this bobber stop closer to the bobber 
and then it'll shallow up your presentation. Or if it's too shallow, you can raise this up your line and, uh, and make sure that the, your bait goes into that uh, lower third of the water column. And we'll talk about that later too. But uh, on that, we have our little bead, which helps protect the, uh, or which actually helps stop the bobber from sliding up further. We have a corky, which I like to put on there uh, as an indicator. So if you throw this in the water and the corky is sitting up on top, you know that it's, it's straight down and there's no tangles. And obviously the, the float, I prefer these arrow floats. They're very nice, uh, but there are many different floats you can choose from. Another bead here below it, and that is to protect the knot. So we have a knot here that goes to our bobber weight, quarter ounce inline weight, often called a bobber weight. I like quarter ounce. You can pair it and match it exactly with your bobber. The problem I have is that if you match it with a quarter ounce bobber and then your bait or like your jig is another quarter ounce, it can actually make your, uh, your bobber kind of sink a little too much. So I like to, to bump the bobber size up just a little bit. After that bobber weight, we actually have 15 pound fluorocarbon. I recommend fluorocarbon. It's very abrasion resistant. It's very strong and it's very clear in the water. So this is definitely what I recommend. And the mono isn't gonna lose you fish or anything, but fluoro is just that little extra, you know? I don't like to skimp out on, on your line. Now in this case, we're using just a bait of eggs. These are actually loose eggs that I, uh, that I wrapped up with spawn sacks. And then I have them just rigged up. Let me show you. Barely hooked on like that. And it actually holds on really well to that, that hook. And this is, I believe, a one, one a size one hook. For at least today, I prefer uh, these little spawn sacks. So we're gonna focus on that today. Anyway, guys, I'm gonna put you on the chest cam. We're gonna go over some of the actual basics of casting, what you're gonna look for, and um, what you're gonna wanna do as you're drifting to increase your chances to catch fish. Now, again, I mentioned before, I'm not an expert. So if you see something that I'm doing wrong, or if you have a suggestion for me, let me know in the comments. I'd love to learn. I'm definitely open to new ideas, new techniques, and uh, I want this, this series to be entertaining as well as educational. So if you can help me, that would be great, and I hope to help you guys. Anyway, let's do this. Take a couple casts, maybe we'll catch one. Boom, chest cam, welcome. So the first couple things you wanna look for when you're drifting is first of all, good drifting water. So you can see here, there's a small channel right here. It's very shallow. Uh, and then kind of a, a even shallower bar in the middle. And then right over that bar, you see that fast moving water and it gets really deep. So they're gonna be resting in that deep area on the seams of the current. The seam is where that fast water right in the middle meets this slow water on the edge. And that, that's what you call a seam. So the salmon, or steelhead in this case, the steelhead are gonna rest in that seam and be conserving energy. And then if your bait goes by right in the seam, they're gonna move out a little bit, grab your bait, and then move back because they want to conserve energy. So the, the least that they have to move to get to your bait, the better. Now that's not to say that throwing your bait in the middle and uh, you know letting it drift down the middle of the fast current isn't going to get you fish. Oftentimes there can be buckets in the bottom where fish will be resting and they can just dip up and, and grab your bait. But the seam is a good place to start. So I don't really know the depth here. So what I'm going to do is keep, kind of keep it deep. I think this is about six feet deep. It does look pretty deep over there, but what I'm gonna watch out for is if it touches the bottom. And you'll know that because the bobber will either, you know, bounce a little bit, like it looks like it's dragging, or it'll even just go under and you'll, you know, you'll think it's a fish, but it'll actually be the bottom. So we're gonna gauge the depth here and uh, start deep. And then if it gets snagged, or if we need to change the depth, we can do that on the next cast. So to cast out, this is more of a swinging cast. You don't wanna flick it because you have a lot of hardware on there and you want it to stay nice as it falls into the water. So I kind of give it like a flinging motion. You know, it's pretty gentle and, and, and minimizes the tangle. And you'll also notice my split shots right in the middle there. That just helps keep the bait straight up and down and helps it sink a little faster. You're gonna want to cast up above where you want to drift at least a little bit. The bait needs time to settle in the water, to, to sink down into that, into that perfect, that lower third of the water column and then start actually doing its drift. So if you cast on top of where you want your bait to be, your bait's gonna be at the top, and by the time it gets down low, it's already gonna be past where you were trying to fish. So we're gonna focus on casting up above and then letting it drift down and letting the bait sink 
until it's right in that strike zone, that lower third of the water column. That was perfect, right, right in the middle. And if I want to, I can kind of pull it towards me a little bit to get on that seam. And now you'll notice that that line, that slow water is kind of pulling the line back a little bit. And so every so often I want to pull up and mend it and, and straighten out that line. And that way it'll allow our, you know, if we have to set the hook, there's not going to be a bunch of slack line and it's going to give that bait a very natural presentation. You don't want the bait to be drifting at a different speed than, than the water. And uh, when you mend that line it makes sure that there's less friction on any of the other parts of the line and lets that bobber drift really naturally. And now I can tell because you see my bobbers like kind of sideways and it's not straight up and down. That's a good indication that I'm too deep and the, the bait is actually just kind of running along the bottom. I'm going to take one more cast and try to get it a little further over there and then we're going to shallow up the bobber a little bit. Hopefully we can get the right depth, you know, on that third cast. But I'm going to cast far over, maybe hit that channel a little better and see if this is deep enough. Now you can see that bobber sitting straight up and down. We know it's not on the ground. I'm holding my rod tip up to keep that slack out of the slower water and it helps minimize the amount of mending. And you can see my high vis line is almost directly pointed at the bobber, which is perfect. And as it goes by, I'm going to open up my bale and let slack go out. What we want to do is make sure that that, that bobber floats, you know, as smoothly as possible down the drift and uh, maximizes the time that it's, you know, fishable. If we don't let slack out, it's going to start pulling towards us and it's going to move out of that drift. So we want to make sure that slack comes out before it starts uh, swinging back towards us. And that's pretty much the basics. As it gets down lower, it does get a little shallower. If you notice that last drift, the bobber started going down a bit and that was because the, the bait was dragging below it. So we're going to shallow this up a little bit and cast along the near seam again. Just shallow it up, maybe like a foot. Let's try again. Again, swing it out there, nice and gentle. That bobber is pointing straight up and down. You can tell that corky's on top, which is a good indicator that, you know, nothing's tangled. Now I want to remember to mend it and I can lift up my line high, mend it over and just let it continue drifting. You see it's bowing out again, back, I'm going to mend it again. The goal here is to move the bobber as little as possible. So if you lift up, try to lift straight up as high as you can. If you start pulling back towards you, then you'll start moving the bobber with it. So you want to lift straight up as much as possible. So I usually lift my arms, get that rod tip into it and make sure that it's uh, not pulling that bobber too much. Now, as soon as you see that bobber go under, you set the hook. You know, you don't want to risk a, sometimes it'll be like, oh, that kind of looked like it was, it was on the bottom and it pulled under, you know, cause it was dragging, but it's, it's not worth risking. Like it could have been a fish. And if you don't set the hook right, then you might've potentially lost a fish. So whenever it goes under, just pretend it's a fish and set that hook. You can see that these things hold together really well. I'm actually very impressed with how well these uh, spawn sacks work. So highly recommend it. If you have a set of, in this case, I had a lot of loose eggs and I just basically bought these spawn sacks and wrapped them up and tied them with magic thread. And they are, they're really great. Super happy with those. I'll show you some other options for uh, lures and baits you can use too. Always check your regs. Some rivers you're not allowed to use barbs. So if your river doesn't allow barbs, then make sure you pinch your barbs or buy barbless hooks for that river. So now that's looking good. It's straight up and down. I'm trying to mend it. I'm high sticking it. I have that rod really high up in the air to make sure that that slack is, you know, affecting the bobber as little as possible. As it goes down, just let some line out, let some slack out. Make sure you minimize the amount of, of bowing and extra, extra line as much as possible because you want that hook set to be as directly to the bobber as possible. Reel in, rinse and repeat. So we're basically just covering water. So most general rules apply. If you wanna, if you wanna search the water really good, you try the, the near side of that, of that channel, the far side of that channel, right in the middle of that channel. Make sure that if there's any fish anywhere that you're putting the bait in front of them at one point or another, you know, one cast might, might hit it just right and it might turn that fish on and it might uh, get them to bite. So try different, different depths, different sections of that same, same run. And just make sure that you're not leaving any of that river unfished. I would highly recommend getting a pair of polarized glasses. So it's not really necessary, but it certainly helps a ton. If you bring 
polarized glasses out onto the river like this, you can really see where that deep water is. You can see where those rocks are. Uh, if there's fish in there, it's, it gives you a much better chance of actually spotting the fish. So a decent pair of polarized glasses are uh, very, very helpful. We're just gonna fish this upper tail out. So this, this is what I would call a tail out. So you can see up there, it's kind of a rapid. Uh, it comes down, there's white water. And then as it gets into this wider part, it kind of opens up and flows into, you can see it kind of slow down, slow down, slow down, and then it kind of evens out. And this is what you call tail out. So up there would be like a rapid, and then this would be a tail out. Uh, down there, you see it's kind of shallow. It's, it's almost like a rapid, but I would almost consider that a riffle. We'll go check that out later. But for now, we're gonna, we're gonna try to fish this, this tail out a little more. Steelhead fishing is something you can prepare for all year. So one of the things I recommend doing is going to your local rivers during the summertime when that water's low. And then you can kind of see where the rocks are. You can see where the riffles are. You can see where the channels are a lot better. Uh, take that knowledge and remember those spots during the wintertime when the water's high. And it gives you a good idea of where those fish might be and where those channels are that you wouldn't normally know about if you didn't scout ahead. So I'll say that I think winter seal has, is probably one of my favorite fisheries. It's a challenge. It's not easy. You really have to work to get these fish. The fish themselves are beautiful the areas that they take you are beautiful like this river is is gorgeous i love going to these small tributaries you know up in the woods this dark green or dark blue water so the whole atmosphere is really really nice so they'll sit in tail outs and conserve energy and and, and rest up before moving up those rapids they'll also sit right at the top of the rapids or the or the riffles and conserve energy there like they may they may have just made it over and they're tired so they're they're going to rest as, as quickly as possible. So you'll find them at the top of those riffles too. Sometimes you'll even find them in the riffles if there's some, some low parts to hide in. They like the riffles. It breaks the surface wa of the water and kind of hides them from predators. So you'll find them hidden in the riffle too. These drifting techniques will work for salmon too. They both, you know, drifting for salmon and drifting for steelhead are both very similar fishing techniques. So this is what we're using now. It's these spawn sacks of loose eggs. Really, really, I'm really happy with how they work. Jigs are common, these guys. These are nightmare jigs. They also come in these really floofy variants. Pink worms, so you'll get a jig head about a quarter or an eighth ounce with a small pink worm. That's a really good one too. Beads, so beads are fished really similar to how baits are fished, you know, drifted, uh, with with these bobbers. In fact, all these baits are drifted with bobbers. They can be soft beads. They can be uh, hard beads here. Different colors. There's different patterns. Like you can get ones that kind of look like small egg sacs. So those were great. You'll notice I have split shots on a lot of these. So the beads are really light. They have no weight of their own. So I'll put split shots on that line to help make that bead dr uh, drop faster in the water. My favorite jigs are these aero jigs, the nightmare color. So these black and red, black and pink, uh, black and orange with a white head in quarter ounce size or eighth ounce size are my favorite by far. I have a lot of these pre-tied, so if I wanted to switch from using the bait to one of my lures, I can just pop these off, tie them on, and uh, be in the water quick. I highly recommend pre-tying. You can do it at home when you're just watching TV. Like I'll turn on Netflix and just start tying lures and tying leaders. It's great because your hands are warm. You have all these baits ready to go. You're not uh, sitting on the cold bank, like wasting time, tying a knot with cold hands. Uh, you can just, you know, if you break off or if you want to switch, it's just a matter of grab, picking one, unwrapping it, throwing it on your inline weight, and then you're, you're fishing again. So to maximize the time that you have while fishing on the water, highly, highly recommend pre-tying uh, a bunch of, of leaders. So here's like a pink variant. And here's another, another jig that's, that works well those, with some beads on it. And then here's those egg sack variants. And some of these are from last year, so they're getting kind of discolored, but they'll still fish all right. Just a lot of different options. I always have pre-tied just hooks too. Uh, that works great for the bait. You can tie, I use the Sunil knot for these egg sacks, or if you have loose eggs, or rather skeins of eggs without the spawn sack on them, I would recommend using the egg loop knot. But let's go ahead and put another egg uh, another egg sack on. So you see here, there's that hook. 
I have a Snell knot. Now for these, it's really nice because you don't need to worry about having an egg loop. They kind of have their own little, their own little sack you can tie on. It's a lot cleaner than using regular eggs. You don't have to touch them as much. And then all I'm doing is, is taking that hook and just finding a spot that's, you know, you're not going to stab some eggs and just barely putting it through like that. Just a little bit, just a little bit. And that's enough to hold it on pretty good, actually. I've noticed that it, they last a long time. So I've been pretty happy with those today. So I've been, I've been tying some of my own jigs this year. I haven't actually used any, but I have uh, <laughs> quite a few of, they don't really look that good yet because I'm still learning. Some of them look right. This one looks pretty good. This one looks pretty good. You can see the nightmare pattern-ish. I got some, <laughs> some Frankensteins, like 80s workout colors. I'll probably have some videos on that too. What else? See my bead collection here. Tons of hard beads, soft beads, all sorts. Bobber stops. So there's two types. There's this type, which goes on and kind of sticks to your line. Uh, or there's this type, which comes with the, the bobbers themselves. I prefer these ones, especially for braid. I have an assortment of hooks here. All ready to go. Not ready to go. They're kind of a mess, but whatever. Yeah, that's my tackle box. I got some spinners and spoons. Some split shots, swivels. All sorts of goodies. Don't want to come prepared. Okay, so let's get back out there. Now another little tip is that when you're tying these leaders, always try to do it the same length. That way when you grab a new leader, you're not ha you don't have to adjust your depth. It's always going to be approximately the same length on the leader end of things. And that way you can kind of, it just like helps with consistency. So if I know that, oh yeah, if I put a new leader on, it's going to be at the same depth-ish as the last leader, just a small tip. I'll put a link below to all of the, all the stuff I've talked about, like the rod I'm using, the rod, the cheaper version that I recommend, I actually have another one that uh, my wife uses. It works great. Um, all the lures and the reels and whatnot. I'll leave a link to all those below, just in case, you know, if you're new and you're looking to get started, you have some, some baseline of, you know, hey, here's what I need and this is gonna get me on the water fishing. Okay, let's move down and we'll try the next little hole. Alrighty guys, calling in today. Early steelhead season run, no fish. Not surprised though. Thanks for joining me. This was episode one of our Fish of a Thousand Cast series for the 2019-2020 winter steelhead season. So thanks for joining me. We're gonna we're gonna be out here a lot. Next time I think I'm gonna focus on spinner fishing. So we're gonna do a nice in-depth tutorial on spinner fishing. That'll be great. Let me know what you think below. If you want me to show you like a uh, different techniques, if you want me to show you like different, or if you have questions, if you want me to show you any different styles that uh, that I can help with, let me know. If you have any feedback for me, I'd love to hear it. I do appreciate all you guys who watch, all you, all you subscribers. It's awesome. I'm, I'm finally seeing growth and it's great. So thank you guys for that. And if you haven't yet and you're, you're excited for this steelhead season, subscribe so you can see this series in full when it's finished. Until next time, guys, thanks a lot and tight lines. <laughs>